So, welcome to practical cell phone spying. Um, before we start, a um, couple of notes on privacy. Um, first off, cellular phone calls will be recorded during the talk. Surprise. Um, if you do not want your cell phone calls recorded, turn your phone off. Um, if you're on Sprint or Verizon, um, you're not GSM, my system is not going to talk to your cell phones at all, so don't even worry about it. Having said that, I would encourage people to keep their phones on during the talk, um, especially if you've got a GSM handset, because the, the, the whole point of this is to show how your phone calls can be intercepted, and if you're not using your phone, then that kind of doesn't work. Um, okay. The, uh, this is the machine that's actually running the demo. Um, I don't know if you can see this big gap here where the hard drive should be. Um, it's actually booted from this USB key, and at the end of the talk, I'm going to be cutting that USB key in half with a pair of, uh, with a, a Leatherman. So um, I'm recording all kinds of very, very sensitive information, all kinds of settings about your phone, logging phone calls, all this kind of stuff, um, but it is all going to be destroyed at the end of the talk. So. Don't, don't worry about that too much. Let me just get my power back in here. Ah, thank you. Okay. Finally, um, I do have a backhaul in place here. Um, I'm currently connected to my Verizon Droid, which is giving me a voice over IP backhaul. So um, if you do connect to the network, um, generally, the only way that you'll know that you're connected to the network is when you try and make a call. If you do make a call from the network, you'll get a recorded message saying you're being intercepted, yada, yada, yada. Um, so effectively, keep your phones on during the talk. And every so often, just, just dial a number, see what happens. If you hear that recorded message, then, then you're attached to my system here. If you don't hear the message, you're fine. In either case, any time that, that anyone is connected to this network, a best effort is going to be made to connect calls, subject to the limitations of asterisk going over voice over IP, going over Verizon. And, and given that Verizon's the only cell phone network that, well, one of two, um, we may have unpredictable results, but we'll see. Okay, so the whole idea of the talk is, uh, I'm talking about IMSI catchers, but in order to know what an IMSI catcher is, you need to know what an IMSI is. Um, and IMSI is an international mobile subscriber identity. Um, you can think of it kind of like a GSM username. It's, it's one of two parts of the, uh, the two, two things that live in your SIM card that authenticate you. Your IMSI is like your username. KI is the secret key that authenticates you into the network. So um, the, the IMSI lives on the, the SIM card, obviously. Um, it's somewhat protected. When you connect to a network, um, one of the first things that that network does is it'll say, stop using your IMSI, use this temporary IMSI instead. And what I'm going to be showing you on the, on the demo a little later is um, you know, how many of these TIMSIs have been allocated as a way of seeing how many people are associated with the base station. So an IMSI is it's kind of a secret. Um, the ICC ID, the, 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 the long string of numbers that's printed on your SIM card, um, it's fairly closely related. Um, for most US networks, and, and a lot of networks around the world, actually, you can uh, derive the IMSI from the ICC ID and vice versa. Um, so it's not really that secret. Um, other places do it slightly better, and the, 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 the ICC ID is just a random number. Either way, the ICC ID doesn't really play too much of a part. Um, I only mention it because you can derive the IMSI from it, in, in the United States at least. So what's an IMSI catcher? Um, Basic idea is that it's a, a spoofed GSM tower. It's, it's a fake base station. Um, the idea is that uh, when your phone is looking for a signal, um, it'll look for the strongest tower. Um, it'll connect to the tower that offers it the best signal. And in this case, because I'm you know, right in front of you with high gain antennas pointed directly at you, um, I'm going to be your strongest signal here. Um, I'm, I'm only emitting about 25 milliwatts here, um, tiny, tiny, tiny amount of power. Um, but because I'm so close and because I'm using these, these directional antennas, um, hopefully I'll, I'll be your strongest signal and, and you should camp over to my network and you know, have some fun. Um, another thing to bear in mind is that in GSM, it's the base station that picks all of the settings. So when you connect to my tower, it's my tower that gets to instruct whether or not to use encryption, whether or not to use frequency hopping. All of this kind of stuff. If I, if I decide not to enable encryption, then I just disable it. And your phone just goes, oh, you've disabled encryption? That's fine. I'll talk plain text. 
Uh, seriously, it's it's that simple. Um, there's there's all kinds of stuff that the the, the base station can instruct the handset to do. Um, Please take my word on it that I'm, I'm not doing anything malicious here. The, this test is for, for functionality only. Um, the, there should be no permanent changes made to your phones whatsoever if you do connect to the network. But if I wanted to, there's all kinds of stuff I could do. I could update your SIM card. I could all kinds of fun to be had. So essentially, if you've got the ability to deliver a, a reasonably strong radio signal um, and your base station will negotiate A50, which is plain text, you're pwned. There's nothing you can do about it. And there's a, a good chance that you won't even know about it. If I'm the tower, then not only am I your network, but I also control your handset as well to a pretty significant degree. Um, the actual idea of an IMSI catcher has, has been around almost as long as GSM has. Um, it was originally patented by Roden Schwartz in Europe in 1993. Um, I've never seen reference to any US patents for it, but either way, patents in Europe are just as public as they are here. So, you know, all of the details of this is all public. Um, the, the, the main important point about this is that if you, go to, if you were to go to Roden Schwartz and say, I want to buy an IMSI catcher, they'll charge you a couple of million dollars. Um, the equipment that I have laid out on the table here, um, by far the most expensive part is the laptop. Um, second up is the USRP at about 1500 bucks, And then, well, I think the next most expensive thing is this $20 instant messaging device. So um, the, the whole point is that um, using these techniques, you can intercept phone calls for a thousand times less money than the commercial systems that do exactly the same thing. So quick note about uh, the, the crypto involved in, in IMSI catchers. If I'm the attacker and I create the base station, um, you have a, a cell phone that connects to my base station, I just say disable crypto. Um, I don't need to break crypto, I don't need any rainbow tables, I don't need any solid state hard drives for fast lookups, nothing. I just say, turn off encryption. It's that simple. Um, in reality, the, the, the GSM specification does actually say that when your handset connects to a network that does not use encryption, it has to put up a warning message. But then if you read further in the spec, there's another place where it says, if you want to disable this warning message, set this little configuration bit in the SIM card. So every SIM card that I have ever seen in my entire life, and, and I've seen a few from you know, various networks around the world, every single one of them has that bit set. Every single operator that I've ever seen disables that warning message. So no phone, I've never seen a warning message on a cell phone that actually says you're connected to an unciphered network, even though the GSM specification requires it. So this is, this is a deliberate choice on the part of the operators. Um, the idea of it is that if you go to a country like India, um, in India uh, they don't support cell phone encryption. It's, it's actually illegal. So obviously you want to be able to roam in India, you want to be able to make cell phone calls, so your phone has to support A50. And if you're getting a warning every time that you connect to a new tower in India, um, you're going to be wondering what the hell's going on and you know, hassling AT&T or, or whoever. So it's, it's one of those areas where uh, you know, functionality and security are, are directly at odds. So note on spectrum usage. Um, one of the, the, the issues that was raised with this talk um, in, in the press is that um, operating a transmitter on a US cellular frequency is a very big FCC no-no. Um, you get in a lot of trouble for doing that. Um, fortunately, we don't actually need to. The reason for this is, there's four bands used for GSM around the world. 850, 900, 1800, 1900. 850 and 1900 are the two that are used in the USA. 900 and 1800 are used in Europe. If you actually look at the, 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 the size of those bands and the frequencies that they cover, there is an overlap between European GSM 900 and the United States ISM band at 902 to 928 megahertz. So I'm actually running my transmitter here as a legal I, uh, ham radio transmitter in the, I call it the ISM band, but it's technically a ham radio band. Um, and as far as your cell phones are concerned, I'm just a European radio transmitter. I'm, I'm a European tower. Um, your phones don't care that I'm in the States. They don't care that they're in the States. They don't care that they're on a completely inappropriate band for the location that they're in. They just quite happily say, like, hey, there's a tower, let's, let's party. <laughs> It's, it's pretty crazy. So if you've got a European phone, if you've got a quad band phone, um, you'll see the network. Um, if you've got a US phone that only works on US frequencies, you will not see the network. So 
The ISM band, um, industrial, scientific, medical. Um, the idea of it is it's for very low power devices that, that use very low utilization, you know, very low actual time on the air. They change frequency very rapidly, um, generally designed to be very non-interfering. But if you look at the regulations, ISM is actually secondary in the band. It's a ham radio band. Um, ham radio operators don't, li don't tend to like it because, uh, you know, there's all this ISM crap cluttering up the, 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 the place. So the, the, the noise is too much of a problem for most ham radio applications, so you know, most hams dismiss it. But for our purposes here, we can run a, uh, a GSM base station on a GSM frequency within a ham radio band. How do we do that? Well, first thing we need is a license. Um, this URL is, is great. The, uh, the licenses for the, ham, the question set for the ham radio exams are all public. So if you go to this website, what they do is they just keep asking you the questions over and over and over and over and over again until you get them right. And if you keep getting it wrong, then it'll keep asking you. And if you get it right, then it'll stop asking you. And it just, it just beats the right answer into you. And you, you can sit down with this site for a you know, few hours and walk into a ham radio exam and just pass it. Um, I'd recommend that you, if you do want to get into this stuff, take the time to learn it, um, take the time to understand. I certainly learned a lot from, from taking my hand tests, um, and, and I'd recommend it to all of you. Um, as we're a ham radio operator now, um, we, we have a 1.5 kilowatt power limit. That's a lot. Um, I, I have uh, another amplifier that I've been using for RFID that's 600 watts. And I've yet to turn that on because it's, it's a terrifying amount of power. Even 600 is, is too much. So 1,500 should be you know, plenty for anything. Um, in terms of, of what we're actually allowed to transmit, um, technically we're, we're transmitting an unspecified digital code. It's, it's bits going back and forth between your phone and my tower. So in ham radio terms, you're allowed to, to transmit an unspecified digital code as long as the specification is public. And in this case, all of the specs for all of the various GSM protocols, they're all public. So it's all good. Um, you're also not allowed to use cryptography. Um, you're not allowed to obscure the meaning of the message in any way. So I guess by law, if I'm running my BTS in a ham ad, I have to disable crypto. <laughs> Damn. No, no limits on antenna size, antenna gain. What, basically, if you can get your hands on it and run power to it, you're, you're golden. Um, the only thing that you ever need to be careful of is RF exposure limits. Um, the FCC publishes guidelines for, for what absorption rate people can tolerate safely. Um, in this case, I am nowhere near those limits. Um, this, this side is my, my transmit antenna. Uh, I think it's this side. Um, and it's putting out a total of about 25 milliwatts. To put that in perspective, your cell phones, um, if they're on the, the European, if they're on the higher bands, the 1800 and 1900, they'll be putting out a watt, that's 40 times more. Um, if they're operating on the lower bands, the 800 and 900, they're putting out two watts, so that's 80 times more. So the phone in your pocket is exposing you to significantly more RF than, than my big scary antennas. The only other real requirement that we have is that the station has to identify itself every 10 minutes. Um, that's actually pretty easy to do because to, to be a ham compliant uh, call sign ID, um, it, straight carrier wave, Morse code, you know, every 10 minutes just you know, Morse something out. Um, we, we could have integrated into, into the, the, the USRP. Certainly the, the USRP is capable of it, um, but it's, that, that's doing it the hard way. There's, there's an easier way to do it. That being, you take a second transmitter, you tune it to the same frequency, um, you make sure that the power level of that second transmitter is slightly higher, so that whenever that transmitter is on, it's effectively DOSing the GSM signal with a ham radio call sign. So all we need is a, an easily scriptable 900 megahertz transmitter. And as it turns out, this little pink instant messaging device is perfect. This is called the IM me. Um, this was um, uh, brought to me by uh, Travis Goodspeed. Um, they're, they're fabulous little devices. They have um, you know, reasonably good power output. Um, obviously, keypad and screen is, is helpful. Uh, no firmware security. You can program them with a good FET. Um, unfortunately, they don't come standard with uh, uh, JTAG and, and you know, RF connectors, but you know, that's easy enough to add. Um, so, yeah, we, we can write firmware for this. We can you know, match the frequency because we've got control over that in software. And 